Nearly 50 years coaching football. Phil Snow has been at so many different college programs. Uh, Of course, most recently with the Chicago Bears of the NFL, was here with Matt Rule at Baylor, but he's been uh, in in many, many places. Uh, 50, nearly 50, I think 47 or 48. 47 years. 47 years. Yeah. And I'm talking uh, Berkeley High School, Winters High School. So it wasn't like you did all the levels. Yeah, I I coached at uh, the high school level, junior college level, 1AA, Obviously, 1A in the NFL, so it, it was, it's been fun. It, it was fun. I have a question for you. This is about the NFL, which you were at more recently. Uh-huh. I saw a stat where the touchdowns through the first couple of weeks of the season were down dramatically. You had that 21-18 game, Washington and the Giants. No one scored a touchdown. They had 13 field goals. Why are the touchdowns down? Well, I, I think one of the big reasons is if you see the uh, the offensive coordinators in the National Football League right now, there are, but, there are a lot of young ones and just starting and what they're doing. So uh, they'll, they'll catch up. But, uh, you know, there's some real veteran defensive coordinators out there that are really good, and I think they're running into those guys, and it's a problem early. And along with a lot of young quarterbacks. Look how many teams have young quarterbacks right now. Mm -hmm. And so early in the season uh, with their offenses, and nobody plays in the preseason anymore. So, you know, it's it's tough. So, uh, But they'll get going. They'll start scoring. For... You're, from your perspective as a coach, uh, I know that there's so much money on the line for these guys, and playing the preseason games is, uh, you know, seen as a lot by an unnecessary risk. But then we get these first two or three weeks of the season, which is kind of now the new preseason, right? It's, is there a, a give and take? Would you rather see them play two of the preseason games as opposed to, you know, some some guys that were starters didn't play any of their you know I think the Rams didn't play any of their starters for the for the preseason but if you look at the teams that are 2-0 right now the Andy Reeds the Mike Tomlins their mm-hmm. guys played two different games mm-hmm. so they they're old school you you have to play and get ready for the season and um, protecting these guys and not playing them in the preseason I think is a big mistake um, on either side of the football and and you can see that right now the teams that didn't play their players are struggling When you watch Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes and what they're doing right now, just kind of what goes through your mind from a football standpoint, but also specifically a defensive standpoint, uh, it just seems like there's there's no real answers, partly because of the scheme, but also partly because of the talent. Yeah, you know, uh, and we played, uh, when I was with the Panthers, we played them, and uh, they had Hill and and, uh, Kelsey was younger. Uh, He's not running as well right now as back then. And, um, you know, Andy Reid is a West Coast guy, that and the west coast wants to get rid of the ball quickly right that that's the west coast offense they want the ball out of their hands but he also was at green bay um uh, with Favre, and so he got the perspective of a, of a mahomes you know that, that that if you don't get rid of the football he has a guy that can do something that's not in the playbook right ad lib and run around and and so with Andy's brilliance in, in, in setting up an offense and game planning and calling it, with Mahomes' ability to move around and make things happen when it's not there, I mean, what a combination it is. It's, uh, it's really hard. You know, if you don't give up big plays against them and you play in the red zone, you have a chance to limit their points and be in the ball game. That's what you have to do to them. And if you watch Cincinnati the other day, that's exactly what they did. Uh, you, but you can't give up big plays, and you've got to limit them to field goals in the red zone, and you have a chance. Otherwise, uh, it's really hard to stop them. We were talking before, and you mentioned Tommy Frazier and how you, you hold him at, at a very high place of players you coached against. Who's the NFL equivalent of that? Well, I, I don't think – well, um, uh, uh, the guy that was at Atlanta, Michael Vick. Yeah, yeah. I coached in the league with him. That was that was Frazier, right? I mean, he was one of the best tailbacks on the field, and he had <laughs> and he had a great arm mm-hmm. too. So, but right now, I don't think there is one uh, uh, that's even close to Frazier with the running ability that they had. Now, the guy with the Ravens obviously can right. be, but he's trying to become a better passer now, and he's not taking off as much as he, sh- uh, he was in the past. But he's the one that would, that would be similar right now. All right, so uh, you, you mentioned Frazier. What made him so special? Osborne has said over and over again that when he was a, fr- a freshman and they were running a scout team, 
and they were getting beat up by a, obviously a hell of a football team. He got mad and like yelled at the freshman that we don't we're not here and and that was kind of the guy he was his competitiveness along with of course he was a great runner but a leader uh, that osborne said is almost unmatched yeah well first of all you had great talent around him sure too, and he had a great defense but uh and he had an offense that fit him to the t with all the run game they had and the play action and his ability to run and then the play action off that um, and, you know, people didn't think Frazier could throw. He threw 23 touchdowns his senior year, um, which is a lot of touchdowns. And so, you know, they beat Florida in the national championship game his last, you know, his senior year. I think it was 63 to 20 or whatever it was. Um, it, it was one of the best football teams, I think, in, in all of college football that's ever played that 95 team uh, with him at quarterback. Yeah, I agree. Miami 01 yep. uh, is one that people talk about as well. Phil Snow. 47 years from Berkeley High School to the last year with the Bears uh, in the NFL in studio with us on 365 Sports. Phil Baylor plays Colorado this week. Colorado, um, they have a they have flash to, to go around. I mean, so much flash, but they don't have, and I'm sure this would drive you nuts as a coach, they don't have toughness and grittiness, and they don't have that that power on defense or offense in the, on the, in the lines. They cannot stop the run. They can't commit to the run. Is that something that you can fix in season at all when you're – I mean, you're the three, four games in, or is this something that you have to make a minor tweak and hope that it works? Well, you know, I had a chance to – I've watched Colorado this, this season, mm -hmm. and I studied them last year. Um, I've had a chance to do that in the last month. Um, you know, the defense at Colorado is getting better. If you watch the second half of the Nebraska game and last week, they're starting to stop the run. They're starting to play better. They shut out Nebraska in the second half, and they gave up nine to Colorado State last week. So, um, And there's some toughness there um, with that defense. So I, I, th I think they're going to get better on defense. Now, I think in the run game on offense, they're going to struggle. And because of that, if they don't get that going, then Secure's going to get hit a lot, right? And by the way, he's a fantastic quarterback. He has uh, – um, he's smart. He's tough. He moves in the pocket. Um, he's extremely accurate and can use all 53 yards of the field, the width of the field. He can throw the out to the field. He can throw the deep ball. He's a good player. If Baylor doesn't get pressure on him, then they'll struggle because they have some skilled guys. Um, you know, Horn and, mm -hmm. and the other kid, he, that they're good. Uh, they have some skill kids. So when people talk about Shador, he's he's contra he's you know he's a polarizing guy. But do you believe in him as a player on the next level? My only concern with him is his size. Okay. Um, but you know he is close to six two, mm -hmm. and he'll get bigger as he matures. You know, as, as as a man, he's still young, but he has the qualities to play in the National Football League. Uh, he's tough. Boy, he moves well in the pocket. He feels the rush. Uh, extremely accurate and can throw all the balls. So um, he will play in the National Football League. Your thoughts about what Matt has done in Lincoln. First year they had games that they could have won, but that's been the trend there for really six to eight years. Uh, then last year close, but they just did not know how to finish or win. And it looks like he's tweaked that. They beat Colorado up pretty quickly. Um, and now a great test, almost like looking in the mirror against Brett Bielema and Illinois. That defense seems to be, they'll strike you, won't they? The Nebraska defense? Yeah. Yeah, you know Illinois' defense is good, too. Absolutely. I've, yeah. I, I've studied them a little bit. But uh, Nebraska, they, what Matt's done there in a year with the culture and how they do things and bring them back to toughness. And um, it's just amazing, I think, what he's done in one year there. Uh, now, I do believe there were some players there that – you know, Matt loves to develop people. And there were some guys on that team that wanted that and had talent. So, And they brought in some guys. But that defense they have, Tony White, uh, not only do they have good players, but the scheme, that 3-3-5 they're running, is re he does it fantastic. He learned it from Rocky Long. And I don't know if you guys, mm -hmm. you guys know Rocky. And, and Rocky was one of the best ever at running it. And uh, t Tony played for him at UCLA and then coached with him at San Diego State and really learned it. And uh, he's done a fantastic job with the talent and fitting it into his scheme at Nebraska. And then Brett's got a defense over there at Illinois. Their secondary is really good. Um, 
uh, that they're not as good up front as Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska's got some guys up front that are really hard to handle. But it's going to be a, a fun game to watch, and I'm really anxious to see Nebraska's uh, freshman quarterback, how he handles that secondary of Illinois. Uh, he is, Raiola, uh, you mentioned, is, he's grown up. You know, there are people that grow up with, you know, football coaches for dads or football players. He's grown up with uh, Matthew Stafford as his godfather. He's gotten the opportunity to work with Patrick Mahomes. How much of that, like when you're recruiting a player and you see that, go, okay, uh, this is somebody we can really roll with pretty quickly because he's gotten, uh, you know, a higher education than most would get. Yeah, I mean, you can see the Manning kid at Texas. Yeah. And, you know, all these guys that have grown up in football their whole lives, just like a lot of the young coaches that are really being successful right now, their dads were coaches. And, you know, look at the two hardballs. I mean, mm -hmm. their dad was a hell of a football coach. So I, I think it really helps. And, and you know, I was with uh, – uh, Riola's old man in Detroit. I was okay. on that on that staff, and his oh, yeah. dad's a fantastic dude. His whole family is wife and he, everybody. He was he was a road grader. No, he he was a tough. You know he 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 struggled with a big guy on him in a fifty defense because you know Dominic was only one hundred eighty five to ninety or two hundred eighty five to ninety pounds. But he could really get to the second level in the four three scheme, and and really was a good pass blocker. Dom and he called, made all the calls. He was really a good player. You talked a couple of times and mentioned how you you've watched film on on this team or that team or whatever. What is uh, maybe a scheme or uh, a team that you've watched here recently that's really jumped out to you for whatever reason that may be? Well, the one that I, I haven't really watched them, but the Tennessee team oh, okay. uh, to yeah. me is a, I, I'm really anxious to when they get in the heat, how they do. Because Oklahoma they, this weekend. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they and, and, you know, Oklahoma, I don't know that they have an identity yet on offense. So mm -hmm. that's going to be an interesting game. But um, they're the one team I think is a surprise right now um, that could, uh, I mean, really make a run at things. All right. How many times when you were at Temple or Baylor did you threaten to fight Matt Rule on the sideline? Well, okay, you guys got to understand, Matt was <laughs> GA for me in 2001 at UCLA, right? Mm -hmm. So Matt and I, have, I mean, uh, you know, we love each other, but, you know, we, we would get <laughs> after each other on occasion. So we had a lot of fun together. It, it, and I think the players liked it. You know, it was, uh, you know, it, we were competitive. Um, and, you know, Matt's the same way. You know, I'm not there with his staff right now, but um, he'll challenge them and, and uh, they'll challenge him. So, you know, I think that the players like that because, you know, everybody's on the player, right? But the coaches are on each other too, and the players can see how competitive it is. They like that. Why does he, in year two, take a team to a different level? You mentioned the culture. He obviously the, the the first year at Baylor, as you know, was a disaster because it just was so much going on. And then you go seven and six or whatever it was, and then had the team that played in the Sugar Bowl. Why does it work that way? Is culture the main thing, or is it developing players? Okay, I think Matt's biggest asset is his ability to get to know the players to a point where they'll do anything for him. He, you guys, he spends so much time with the players. And not only just, not football, I'm talking about their personal lives, their family, every, everything. And um, as, as you get to be around Matt more and more as a player, they'll just go to war for the guy. I mean, he knows they believe in him, and he believes they believe in each other, and um, it's, a, it's a hell of a combination. It's that foxhole, right? It is. Yeah. It is. And um, I'm telling you, his players right now, if you go, I went, in the, I went over there this spring. And I was so impressed. The culture already developed in that building and how everybody's on the same page. And, how, and, and you can see the love for each other in the building and on the field. So he, in, in a short period of time, he's done a fantastic job there. How much of that, like, you know, when you guys got here, it was a completely different rebuild type situation because you had a lot of guys that were really successful a couple years before and had won big 12 titles but had gone through all this off the field strife that um that just kind of leveled their emotions like you had to build them back up uh for on a different way yep. you know uh and and clean out like some of the things that had gone on uh, with nebraska how much of that like them the culture building so fast there is 
you can feel it from the student body and the fans and the people in Lincoln, how badly they want this back to where they believe it can be. And the kids wanting to be a part of that because as opposed to being kind of sad about it, they're enthusiastic about bringing the glory back to the to Lincoln. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you a story about uh, uh, Baylor. And, and to me, this is the biggest difference. Uh, by the way, Art Brile is one of the best coaches that's ever coached football. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and uh, so, but, but when we got there, our first workout in the off season, <laughs> this is the darndest thing. <laughs> so we got done and the players were all at one end of the field and all the coaches were at the other end. I don't know why we were there, why we were separated at the time. The players started yelling at the coaches, you Northerners, go home. We don't want you here. <laughs> what? <laughs> the honest to God truth, guys. <sighs> so we started from there at Baylor. Now, they didn't start from there at Nebraska. I know that because those, a lot of the, 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 the really good players on that Nebraska team are from the state of Nebraska, and they love Nebraska. Right, so they just wanted some. They wanted somebody to come in w w with an idea and a program and a process, and and boy, they really run with it. So I, you know, two different jobs, completely two different jobs. Yeah, the, the totally different situations you're walking into, but that that northern that's. I'd say I, I'm not surprised. Like I'm surprised when I heard that, but then I'm like, that about sounds right. I guess I guess you know it was just such a mess back then. Um, it's amazing what you guys were able to, to accomplish and how that all built up. And a couple of guys that were really key in that that I was very much looking forward to asking you about were Jalen Petrie and Terrell Bernard. And Petrie um, is looking – he was out there flying around uh, on Sunday night making big hits, but Terrell has turned into such an incredible player. Injuries cut his, his playoff short, but he was having a hell of a season a year ago. Just what did you see in, in those guys? Did you kind of know, like, hey, these guys have this ability – or how quickly did you sort of know that? And just their place in this whole puzzle for you guys in Waco. Can you just speak to, to Bernard and Petrie? Well, you know, Petrie, he's one of the few players that stayed in that class yep. when we came in. So he I loved think he was Bay the only one. Yeah. He, yeah. From, the, from the commitments <laughs> to the previous coaching yeah. staff. Yeah. yeah, he was the only one that stayed. And Terrell, he was actually going to the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And I saw him on tape. They showed him to me. And I said, oh, we got to go get this dude. So we went down there and... Um, Dealt a lot with his grandparents, and they were fantastic, and he ended up coming to Baylor. But, And, you know, it was really sad when uh, uh, Clay Johnston got hurt our last year. Yeah. Right? Uh, and But I knew that he would – Terrell would come in and play. He, I mean, he was ready to play. And, you know, we had Jordan Williams that played the one backer, and Jordan looked clumsy at times and all that, but, man, he made plays, right? I mean, yeah. he was around the football and create turnovers. So Terrell wasn't playing that much, and then when Clay got hurt, Terrell took that job over and ran with it. But uh, both guys, fantastic people. You know, our last year at Baylor, Petrie redshirted. So Matt had promised him he would redshirt him that year. So he played in the first four games. I said, Matt, hold on. He's, a, he's our best Sam backer. What are we doing? Yeah. And he said, Snow, I promised him. So uh, that's, you know, we, we didn't get Petrie that year, right? But I knew he was going to be a great player. And, and they, David played him at the exact, I mean, they played him perfectly. The spot they had in the, in the defense was ideal for him. They, they have a young lineman. I think he's a freshman, Van Poppel. Uh, who's a very talented young defensive lineman, and he's going to let him play the four games. And he told Van Poppel, we can play more. You can play a little bit here and there. But if you wait a year in red shirt, you'll be Ty Robinson, who's the big m m a hell of a player for them. How hard is it to let someone marinate that might help you win right now? That's tough. You know, it depends on where you're at in the program, right? And um, – but Matt had promised Petrie that, mm. and so <laughs> and he just lived with those. You know, we were really lucky that year, too. Clay was the only one that got hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that really helped us. Otherwise, we, we would have missed Petrie. Phil Snow in studio with us. Uh, Baylor, Temple, Bears, and many Carolina Panthers. That, that didn't go very well, did it? That, and, and they're not going well now, either. Is, is that, and I don't mind asking you this, is there dysfunction within that franchise? Well, the guy I feel bad for is Matt because, guys, we went there, and the first year we're there, we have COVID. Guys, we were there six months and had never met a player. That was a random we, at Baylor, yeah. 
We had no OTAs. The first time we met our players was when they came to camp. And wow. then, and so that was, and, and you know, we, we won five games and, and we were in every ball game. And then we went and tried to find a quarterback. You know, we had Darnell and uh, Baker the next year, yep. you know, we had, uh, we just couldn't find a quarterback. And so the next year we won five and then the third, but by that time, I don't know what happened between Tepper and Matt, uh, but it, 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 I don't think it had gone well. I mean, he had a six-year or seven-year deal, and after two years, it, Matt was worried about his job, which was ridiculous. Uh, I mean, we're coaching in the COVID, right, mm -hmm. and, and trying to develop. By the way, I played 11 rookies on defense our first year there. <laughs> 11. Yeah, I remember that being the talk was like, hey, the bright spot is that this defense has got some young players on it and just give us some time and let it build up. And Well, the yeah. second year we were second in the uh, National Football League in total defense. Yeah. And we had developed those young guys, but uh, we just never could get over the hump offensively and, and we just never got it going. But, you know, we didn't have enough time either. You can't give somebody two years. And, and really, Matt didn't even have the third year. She, he was under – we lost to Cleveland on a 58 or 59-yard field goal the first game of the year. It was over. Like, you could feel it that that was it. I mean, I could feel it then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what was tough, too, is that third year, we had played four games, and defensively we had played five games, number of snaps. That's how much we were on the field. Wow. Yeah. We just couldn't get it going offensively. But, you know um, – I would really lo love to see Matt someday go back to the National Football League. Um, you know, win in college again and go back and, and, and do it again. If he wins in Lincoln and he's had a good start, I will fight him. I will be the one on the sideline fighting him. I will. I will. <laughs> they, they've waited too long. I mean, I will, I will have a conversation. He did tell me when he decided to take the job at Carolina the day that he became official that he kind of looked back at that. Uh, and I want to get into what Dave Aranda is doing at Baylor as the defensive coordinator. He looked back and he probably thought that, that, that the speculation that week may have created a little bit of a, an issue that week. Georgia was great. Uh -huh. they, you could see what they were about to do. Did you feel that as well? Yeah, you know, kind of. I, th I think, uh, you know, Matt was not only pursued by Carolina, but the New York. I think he was going to go to the New York Giants is where he was going. Uh, Matt was. Um, he had the New York was almost done and then Tepper came in and offered him so much money couldn't turn it down but uh, you know Matt had always wanted to coach in the National Football League mm -hmm. it was yeah, a burning desire of his um, and I we we loved Baylor I mean and we had it rolling at Baylor I mean I think we could have done some really special things if we would have stayed but in his heart he wanted to do the NFL thing and you know at his age and that kind of money went and did it that last game, since we're, we're talking about that, Jalen Hurts was the quarterback, right, for Oklahoma. Was that the last game you guys played, the, the Big 12 title game? Was that Hurts? That was, that was Hurts. We played yeah. him twice that year. Yeah, so just any surprise that he's gone on to, to be the, the player that he is for the Eagles at, at the next level? You know, I have a lot of respect for the, that. He, and he's a grown man now. But, okay, we played him the first game, and we were ahead 31-10 at half. And he came out the second half and ran the ball 20. Like, they ran triple option is basically what they did. Two weeks later, Oklahoma they play Oklahoma State, and, and Gundy says, well, hell, this is the triple option we're playing. <laughs> he gave up, and, and that was his last year, right? He gave yeah. up throwing the football so that that team could win. And they actually were running the triple option. So the second half against us, they ran the option the whole – and we and they kept going forward on fourth down. They end up beating us. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was a hell of a game, though. Hell of a game. Yeah, and, then, and then in the championship game, he, he didn't really want to run. I'll, I'll never, we we hit him in that first game. Henry Black hit him on the five yard line, and and he and, and he wore a visor. Hurts did, and he hit him so hard it popped the visor out on contact. Mm. And I mean, he is just a tough. I had a lot of respect for him. Now I. I, I wondered if he was going to throw the ball well enough in the National Football League mm -hmm. with enough accuracy. And, and he had the arm strength with the accuracy, and he's doing it. And, and, it, and he's, it sounds to me like he's a great leader. Do you, uh, your thoughts on, I know it, it's, it's been a little bit because you were in the NFL, but uh, the way college now has the transfer portal, uh, NIL, which has been long overdue because, I mean, that, that's just from the NCAA, could maybe 
buttoned that up 10 or 15 years ago by, by bending a little bit. Your thoughts about recruiting, is that fun at the college level for you who had been in the game for so long? Well, actually, recruiting now, the NIL, is like the old days recruiting junior college players. We used to recruit them for four or five months. It was actually fun because it was like a, a horse race, right? I mean, <laughs> you didn't spend two years recruiting somebody, right? Right, um, yeah. And so that's what the NIL is now. Um, but I still think, guys, you're not going to develop a team and win big games and your conference by the by by – getting players from other teams, a bunch of them. Now, you're going to have to get a few, just like we got junior college players to, to fill in. That's what they're doing. But the good programs, Matt Rule is not going to go out and get 20 players. I mean, he may get six to eight players a year. I think they had the lowest number that left last year mm -hmm. in college football. And, and if you look at Georgia and Ohio State, and you're going to lose eight to ten a year. Um, but you're going to, the only way you're going to really develop a program is you got to recruit high school kids and develop them. Will it be better than now with revenue sharing? If you can get guys to like commit to a couple years before they jump in the transfer portal or have contractual things that would, uh, you know, have some sort of nominal penalty so that kids don't maybe float a little bit. I think, I think part of the problem, I love the the portal as far as players getting to find a place where they, they really need to be. But I think the scary part about it is I'm just going to call up until I hit somebody who gives me the number I want. And then you're not really doing anybody any favors. No, you know, and I know I, I'm not going to mention a team. Um, I know a defensive coordinator, a pretty good football team right now. And they took some guys from some big schools and they're big too, but they took some guys that were supposed to be legit guys and paid them a lot of money. Right. And cut them after spring football. They were just a cancer on their football team. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it paid them a lot of money. And, it, and it's happened more than you think. And so you got to be real c careful with that, uh, you know, who you take, how they fit in, all those things. And Dabo's taken a lot of heat at Clemson. But, you know, there's, there's a, they have a program, and, and he wants people that fit that. Um, and so Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. But no, you're good. It, 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 but it seems like he's going to have to maybe give in a little bit, right? Yeah, I, I mean – I, I think they take a few, but 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 if you look at Georgia right now, how, how many transfer guys do they have that are actually helping them win? About they do five, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, uh, that's I think what I think the Clemson fans actually want from Dabo is he's at zero right now, yep. you know, and they're not saying like we want you to take twenty five transfers like Dion. Yep. We want you to take five just for the guys that we lose for whatever reason that. You don't have to play true freshman against Georgia. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I, I want to ask about Georgia. That was y'all's last game at Baylor. Was that that Georgia Sugar Bowl game? We mm -hmm. we touched on just kind of the build up, and it was just you know it was what it was. But did you see then because they they got rolling rolling right after that game? Like that was like before the national title runs. Yep. Did you sense kind of what Kirby had building there and looking at them and and knowing what was coming? Well, you know, I, I, the first national title game, um, they won real – oh, against TCU, when they beat T, the heck out of TCU. Yeah. Uh, one of my brothers asked me, Phil, how does that happen? How can they beat TCU <laughs> like that? I said, listen, that, okay, if you recruit their five years, they're getting five to seven five stars every year. Yeah. And so what happened was Kirby got there – he started winning after about the fourth year, right? So you got 20, 25 five stars on their team. And five stars, it takes five seconds to watch them on tape and say, I'm taking that dude, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so those guys, you don't miss on those guys very often. Well, he has a whole team of five stars. And so that's, that's a success, right? He's, he's got the Jimmys and the Joes. And, and uh, now they do a hell of a job coaching, a great system, all that too. But he has really good players. So, and, and that day, remember the old line didn't play? Yeah, and the backup O line uh, against us at Baylor, mm -hmm. they were all five stars. <laughs> yeah, I mean every one of them. Every one of them. They all came in, and I said, "Well, these are the back." <laughs> I mean, they look well, better than anybody we played. I remember it was like a reality check because, and this was even pre. This was like right before NIL, basically. But it was a reality check of like, yeah, they're not even playing their their best of the best at every position, and they're still rolling along like this. Like that's just like, whoa, Georgia's something serious. And now we've yeah. seen the results ever since then. But yeah, that was. That was quite the that was quite the matchup. And yeah. you know Saban did it for years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. 
So um, Dave Aranda is now calling the defense. And it was really almost shocking. It, you, you would watch them. Uh, Matthew Pallage, a young coach who was at Oregon, went from Baylor at Oregon. And then Dave's taken over the defense. Uh, so far, they've done pretty well. I mean, Utah had the early score, but 77-yard block field goal return for a touchdown. How difficult is it to do what he's doing as a head coach and also – being the defensive coordinator. And I'm not sure if you've been able to watch them at Air Force last week. What are they doing, and do you see anything different? Well, you know, there's guys like Sarkeesian's doing a hell of a job doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. There are guys doing it, and I think Dave has talked to Sarkeesian about it. You know, how do I do both? And uh, obviously, you know, Aranda, what he's done defensively, you know, stands by, you know, by itself, right? I mean, he's really good at what he does. So what he's done is he's went in there and, 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 and put together a system with that staff. And they're real detailed. They're playing hard. It looks like they're physical. So I'm really anxious to watch them against Colorado. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really am to see. I want to see if their skill guys in the back end can match up with Colorado skill guys. And if they can, then, uh, you know, people are going to have to deal with their defense. Did you come across him much, like even coaching clinics? Or I, just, I know the coaching such a fraternity and there's all these tentacles, but did you cross paths with Aranda much, if ever? Okay, so Aranda, when I was a defensive coordinator at UCLA, he would come and visit. When okay. I was a defensive coordinator at Arizona State, State, he would come and visit. And he was young at Arizona State, really young coach. I'm telling you, David has – I mean, he was always going and trying to get better at football. Uh, spent a lot of time with a lot of people. Uh, and he's got a lot of knowledge and, and, and really has a hell of a library of defense. So you're not going to surprise him with anything, and he'll have some surprises for you. So uh, he's good at what he does. He just has to make sure they have the right guys, enough of those dudes, right? And, and maybe they're getting to that point again because last year was a, it was a disaster all across the board. Well, let everyone know, you mentioned Frazier when he was at Nebraska. This is more about – what you guys did in 96 at Arizona State, that was the team that went almost played for a national title with Jake Plummer. Tell everybody what happened in 95 and what you did, for those who don't remember, the following year in Tempe when you just swarmed them. Well, and we did play for the national title, by the way. We lost 20-17. to 17. If we win the game, we would have been the only undefeated team in, in, and, in football that year. And that was the year Florida won it, right? Yeah, yeah, Florida had been beaten by Florida State. They rematched in the bowl game, and Florida won the game. But we would have been the only undefeated team, and we lost We lost with 13 seconds to go in the game. Oh, so, my Lord. Yeah, bad deal. But anyway. Um, Thanks in, for bringing that up, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> in 95, we went to Nebraska – and they beat us 70 to 28, I believe. Uh, and I was an events coordinator and was completely humiliated. I mean, we just. Um, so what we did in the offseason that year is I studied them for six months. I said, we got to because uh, we're, we're going to play them again in 96 at our place. We added one defensive player to our defense. Uh, and it was Derek Rogers. He oh. played our weak side end. Now, Derek was a hell of a football player now. Um, by the way, that's a great story. He played t two years of football before we got him. He played in the band in high school, didn't play football. Went in the military, played flag football and liked it. So he went to junior college one year, and then we got him. So that was a great story. But we played him at, at, at Tempe. I, think, I believe it was the second or third game of the year. They were number one in the country. And we beat them 19 to nothing that day, and we had two safeties. I, I don't think Coach Os Os uh, Tom had ever been shut out, Coach Osborne. I think that's the only shutout he's ever had. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, and Frank Cush, that day, the stadium was named after Frank Cush. Guys, it was the wildest setting. Um, you know, and after the game, it was scary. I, I went along the wall and got out of there. They were pepper spray. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> but it, it was uh, – but, you know, you beat the number one team in the country. And uh, and then we went on undefeated. We were 11-0 and undefeated and played Ohio State in the Rose Bowl and lost in the last uh, – in last seconds and that in that ohio state team guys there was probably i don't eight to ten first round draft picks on it mm. Do, having been at arizona state and i know it's been a long time since you were there but they've they've been kind of wandering in the wilderness uh and maybe now that they're in the big 12 and, and they have some new leadership there they seem like they've been doing a little with a lot 
at Arizona State athletically, especially for the football program. Do you feel like if they have the right people in place, that's a place that can get the fans re-energized and can and can really be a player because it's a beautiful campus. What like there's nothing wrong with Arizona State at all. And it, it seems weird to me that they've been kind of in this in this desert. Well, not they're literally in the desert, but in this football desert for so long. You know, I think there's certain schools that when you look at them from the outside, you say, well, how can you not win there? But guys, if you look at the history of Arizona State, there hasn't been a lot of winning coaches there. It, it's a I don't know why it's a tough job. Um, I mean, even a guy like Dirk Cutter. I mean, Saban gets on the uh, TV show the other day and said, I tried to hire Dirk. Yeah. Um, Dirk's a hell of a football coach. He couldn't win there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, and you know, like UCLA is a hard job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Terry Donahue only won 63% of his games. You know, that's all he won at UCLA. And everybody thinks he had this, you know, he won, you know, close to 80%. And, and, um, and, and so Dick Tomey won 63% of his games at Arizona, and they fired him. <laughs> Terry Donahue got a lifetime contract with 63%. <laughs> with 63. So yeah. there are certain places that are harder to win at. Why, I don't know. And I think Arizona State's one of those jobs. You coached Pat Tillman. I did. And we all know the story, uh, and, and that he was killed in action, uh, friendly fire, I think it was, too. But you, you coached him. What was he like as a football player? Because I remember him. He was fierce. He was good. And not a surprise that he did what he did. You know, Pat was probably the most interesting guy I've ever coached. Um, he was good looking. He was a straight-A student. He cussed like a sailor. Uh, he, um, he had a – when I went to recruit him, he had a record, a police record. Mm. And so I looked <laughs> into it, and he was fighting in bars as a teenager, like the fist fight. I mean, you're talking about play defense. the yeah. most unique guy. So I'll, I'll tell you this story. The head coach comes in my office. We in, 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 in at Arizona State, the stadium. We were on the sixth floor, which is the the, the highest uh, floor in the stadium in the building in the stadium. And uh, Bruce Snyder comes in my office and slaps down a magazine on my, on my desk, and it's Pat sitting on something. And matter in hell. He says, Snow, get this stopped. I said, Coach, what are you talking about? He said, he's sitting, and he walks me over to the window, and I don't know if you've ever been to Sun Devil Stadium. Yeah, I was there when okay. Nebraska beat You Florida. know the light yeah. standards? Yep. Mm -hmm. Every Thursday, he walked up the light standard and sat on the top of it. <laughs> Guys, with no safety net, no, no ropes, Every Thursday. So that video was from a helicopter, or that picture was from a helicopter that took him sitting up there. Oh, wow. And he'd go up there every Thursday. He would jump off bridges 60, 70 feet. He, I said, Pat, dude, what are you doing? He said, Snow, anything that I'm scared of, I go do. Mm. I don't want to be scared of anything. He was the most unique player I've ever coached. And you talk about tough and a, and a football player. Well, I mean... I did not know any of those stories. I just knew he was a really good football player. And then, of course, the story about him, uh, after, you know, entering the military. I mean, that everything you talked about, it fits to it perfect. Uh, yeah. it, well, he well, he's playing. For, he's uh, starting in the National Football League, and I see him over the spring. I said, Pat, you look skinny right now. What are you doing? He says, Snow, I'm going to run a marathon. <laughs> He says, oh, I want to run a marathon, and it's bothered me I haven't. Guys, he's playing in the National Football League. He lost like 20 pounds, went and ran a marathon, then gained it back and had a hell of a year. And it, it, was there a player at Baylor that you feel like when you talked about how you, how you Matt, and that staff would develop players? You mentioned Henry Black. or I just maybe – is there is, – I know there's probably more than – there's maybe eight or ten that, that you just didn't know was going to be able to play. But – just became one hell of a player with you that maybe just because he had that resiliency and fire. Well, I think the, the, the biggest one you just mentioned was Henry. Okay. You know, when we got there, Henry didn't play at all. And he didn't play for us the first year, year or two. And, guys, Henry went and played four or five years in the National Football yeah. League. Yeah. I mean, it, what a great story. Um, never said a word, tougher than heck. Um, 
So he was quiet with y'all too, right? Because he he just seemed like a very quiet guy yeah. from what we got to see. So he was just that way naturally, I suppose. Yeah, but I'll tell you what. I, I You know, I coached the safeties, um, and there, there, there was no fooling around in that room. Mm -hmm. Henry sat there, and if a guy got out of line, he'd say, guys, that's enough. And, boy, everybody <laughs> when he said that was enough. That was enough. So, uh, but, um, boy, what a story Henry was. Uh, you know, uh, Chris Miller. I mean, Chris was. Oh my guys, God! He he pound for pound is the toughest player I've ever coached. You know, he only weighed 180, 81 to eighty five pounds, and if you watch him strike people, uh, it's unbelievable. He he was really, really pound for pound. He's the toughest guy that I've ever been around. Safety, uh, who got he like Mr. Targeting. He, he did not care. That was, was the stealing. downside to the flying yeah. in and tackling. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? Matt says, uh, Snow, what are we going to do about the targeting? And I said, Coach, if we change who he is and we try to take his aggressiveness out, he won't be the same player. So he said, okay, we'll just live with it. He had three of them that year. But the receivers second guess when they felt oh, him around them. Hey, guys, it, I'm telling yeah. you, I talked to receivers in the NFL – they said, hey, Snow, we were f afraid to go across the middle because Miller didn't care about getting kicked out. I said, you're <laughs> right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, those, those safeties you coached with Tillman, with him, and then, uh, you know, with uh, Miller and – Oh man, people love love the stories that we're, we're we're discussing with Phil Snow in studio, and we appreciate you. Uh, the Bears, you were there, and I know. Did you try to give some? Do you consult now? Because Alexis Cuban he went to Baylor. Uh -huh. She went to Baylor. She's now writing for a a, comp, a state of the Louisville, the Louisville. Courier. I just talked to her this morning. Yeah, oh, and really? <laughs> you had consulted the defensive coordinator at Louisville, and and uh, so are you doing that quite a bit from from home? Do you go visit? What do you do? I do both. Ron English, the defense coordinator at Louisville, played for me, GA'd for me, and then came back and coached with me. Mm. So he called me this summer, and he said, Snow, I'm going to send you some tape, and I want you to look at it and see, do you have anything that could fit into what we do? And so I called him. I said, Ronnie, come on, you need to come a couple days. I got some really good stuff for you. So he's going to run a package this week that we, that we put in, and he's really excited about it. But um, – yeah, you know, I try to do that. I, you know, I'll try. To, you know, it's like the defensive coordinator at uh, USC, mm. Lynn. Yeah, the you know, his Lynn. dad was the head coach of the Chargers, mm -hmm. and so he he'd never coached in college before, and he gets the UCLA job a year ago, and he calls me. I don't know him at all, and he says, uh, "Snow, I've been told to call you about college football." He said, "I've never coached." I said, "Well." And so we talked, and, I, and, and I, I'd met his dad. I had a lot of respect for his dad. So I said, yeah, I'll help you, whatever. So we talked on the phone probably four or five times for, oh, equivalent to seven, eight hours. And he went on and had a, you know, close to a top 10 defense, and then he got the USC job. Um, and then they tried to hire me, and I just said, nah, I'm done, guys. I'm well, not well, he's he's the hire of the offseason for – for me at USC. Dan's no, guys, he yeah. is. I'm telling you, he, if you sat down with him, how impressive he is, how he handles himself, um, how bright he is. Um, he's a fantastic football coach. He, he I mean, he's going to go like this. Him and Tony White, uh, mm -hmm. match DC, are probably the two hottest coach, young coaches in football right now. By the way, Louisville has a defensive end, Ashton Gelati, who is a monster. Is I'm he? sure, yeah, I'm sure you watch, I mean, you know, yeah. watch him a little bit. He's, he is, he is really good. Yeah. So you just mentioned that he's like, hey, come coach here. So just where are you now? I just, are you just done? Like, I mean, is the consulting just give, give you that fix, but you don't have to be in the office hours a day? Just can you kind of talk about where you are in life and, and in your career and, and where all that is right now? You know, um, you know, at some point, I thought I'd coach forever, right? And then, it, 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 you know, about a year ago, um, it started to be a job for me. Okay, yeah. And it's never has been a job. Um, one of the problems, if you look at the National Football League right now, there's a lot of older men coaching. And it's because they won't give up the money. And there's a lot of guys in their 70s coaching. It's amazing. Or high 60s. And financially, they don't need to. But when they're paying you a million, two million dollars, it's hard to say no the next year, right? Sure, yeah. And so I had to make that decision. And um, my wife and I sat down and, and we'd like to enjoy our life. So I said, you know what? That's it. So, you know, I'll, I'll consult. Um, how long I'll do it, I don't know. And then uh, we'll just go from there.
Do you have um, shirts with every logo of every team you ever coached or not? <laughs> I, I, okay, so my wife has put together all this stuff, and she wants to put it up in a room, and I won't let her, right? All the plaques and shirts and articles. and Guys, at UCLA when I was there, they even wrote a Christmas carol with my name let, it, let us know <laughs> it was unbelievable it was yeah. in the uh, la times and you know it has so many neat things over the years right but they're all in boxes mm. so um you, it's, it's, it'd be kind of like your your sports memorabilia man cave or something <laughs> yeah but i i don't even have a man cave so <laughs> <laughs> i always wondered about that with the players who have been on five or eight teams and coaches who have been everywhere and, and have your, you know, your polos or your hoodies or whatever. Maybe you have a, a Matt Rule smock uh, <laughs> that, that he made uh, pretty popular with the, the, the run at Baylor. Man, I, I, you are uh, – every Paul, give him your idea on the air. Oh, okay. Someone just brought it up. Yeah, Paula McReynolds no, no. just brought this uh, up. Uh, we have Phil Bennett on every week. Uh -huh. And you know Phil. I do. Uh, okay. I think we should do a series of videos of you guys breaking down defense – called Get Your Fill. Uh, I mean, working title, working title. Uh, but I think it would do very, very well. Just you two sitting oh. in a room with film going, here's what I like, here's what I don't like. This is really innovative. You know, we'll put Tony White's defense on and you guys can just go to town and it would do very well. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, okay, there we go. All right. That's uh, all I need. <laughs> we, we have Phil on, and, of course, he's, he's a mess, too, but uh, he's been a lot of different places, too. Oh, he's a great guy. Well, I, can I tell you a story about him? Yes, sure. please. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm coaching at Arizona State, and we go and play uh, Oklahoma State. And, no, that's not true. I'm at UCLA. Let me get my story right. I'm at UCLA because I'm thinking about the player it happened to. Is at UCLA. So we go to UCLA. We're playing Oklahoma State. They have a first-round draft pick. I can't remember his name. The 49ers drafted him in the first round. Anyway, and um, Ricky Manning Jr. was covering him. And Ricky was played a long time in the National Football League. At, he was a great corner. Anyway, he gets like six PIs in the game. Ricky does on him. <laughs> And so, and we beat the heck out of him that day. Um, um, we had a good day. Anyway, so the, uh, on Sunday, I get a phone call. Snow, this is Bennett. So, what are you doing? And he starts going off about these PIs. Turned everyone in. He turned them all into the, the uh, league office. <laughs> They're not PIs. They're, you know, it, it was the fun. Because I, I believe he was at SMU at the time. Yeah, I probably think, was the head coach at the time. Yeah. Yes, he was. And so it, it was great. But you should have heard him on the phone. <laughs> no, I, can, I can hear it in my head right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. He is, uh, man, uh, just to listen to you two would be great. And, and maybe we, could, we can get that done. Uh, the Phillip. The huh? Phillip. The Phillip. <laughs> the Phillip. Uh, how's your golf game besides probably scratch? No, you know what? Stop. I'm, you know, I okay, I, th I said I was going to do two things when I retired. I was going to get better at golf, and I was going to read the Bible, completely read the Bible. Okay, let me tell you a golf story real quick. When I was 17, I took my first golf lesson. My brother was 16, so we took six golf lessons together, and then we played nine holes with a pro at the end of the six lessons. And he pointed at me, and he says, you go find another sport, and you keep playing golf. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? He was absolutely right. Did yeah. you not play for Nevada Reno, or what was that? That was my son. Oh, that was your son. Okay. Yeah, my son. Well, played at Michigan State and then Reno. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, I, I tell you what, they've, they... <laughs> so basically, the golf church said, you need Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, do you... Craig mentioned this earlier about what you're doing, and you're now pretty much it's over as far as the, the actual working for somebody to coach. How difficult is it to walk away? That, that seems to be something that's kind of a, a, a lot of coaches. That has to be difficult. You know what, though? It wasn't for me. Okay, I, good. Because I knew it was time to do it, and so I felt good about it. And Now, you always look back and say, you know, I, I, I watch guys coach – 
coaching right now, right? I'd love to watch like Fran Brown at, at Syracuse. Yeah, yeah how about love, that? Love, and and uh, Elijah Robinson's his D mm -hmm. coordinator. Nixon's his offensive coordinator. So, you know, I love watching the guys that I worked with coach. So uh, that's the only time I get riled up where I'd like to be helping them, right, and stuff. But, um, no, it was time. Yeah, and I guess it, the, the fact you can just say that's it. Yep. And you still have enough where people contact you because of your knowledge. Well, as he said, it started – to be a job and it wasn't as fun like yeah. you said so yeah but you still get your fill when you need to or however you want to when people come talk to us it sounds like the best of both worlds it in is. a lot of ways and, and you know i feel real bad for some of the guys i worked with because they retired in their 50s you know we didn't make a lot of money the last 10 years the coaches this money thing is and so you know i was fortunate where i i got to make some money at the end of my career but i know a lot of guys that that are my age that you know retired and and didn't make a lot of money in their careers mm. it's did, amazing how much money they're making today did you make combined perhaps more money those last five to eight years than you did the first 45 or so no, no question really no question did you ever work for somewhere else where you were getting paid by maybe another school or two or team or two or is yeah. that yeah i did yep um when i went to ucla from arizona state i was getting paid by both schools mm. So that's happened. But, guys, we didn't make a lot of money back then. You know, I, I mean, we made just enough. We paid our bills, and we, you know, had extra, and, not, and we had everything we wanted. But, boy, the, the young coaches today, if they continue to make this kind of money, mm. it's unbelievable. It really, really is. Uh, man, this is something that we're thrilled you came to see us. And, and the chat room, people who watch this show are just they, – they, they're riveted with all the various stories that I know we could tell a hundred more. We, we really, really could. Um, and you have always been great. We saw you uh, when Matt came into town about a year ago, a year and a half ago, whatever, yeah. to recruit. You were there. We had a chance to visit. And even then, your stories have been phenomenal. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Phil Snow, uh, nearly 50 years as a coach. Uh, in the NFL, high school, and also in college. We're going to have to do this again sometime because I know that's not all the stories you have, and I'm sure it's yeah. not all the questions we have, but that was a lot of fun, and I think we'd, we'd love to just figure out another time to do this again someday. Yeah, no qu yeah, anytime. Berkeley High School, Winters High School, Laney yeah. College, Boise yeah. State, California, Arizona State, UCLA, Washington, the Huskies, the Lions in the NFL, Eastern Michigan, Temple, Baylor, and the Carolina Panthers and Chicago Bears. Yep. What a run. I, I do have one more question that you ran that sure. down. You were in a lot of Pac-12 schools. Uh, yeah. Did you have any types of feelings when you saw that? I mean, it's coming back. It's just going to be a wildly different version of the Pac than it was. But did you have any feelings, or is that just sort of like realignment and stuff? You're kind of disconnected from those types of things. You know, I really do have a lot of feelings because okay. I grew up out west. And that conference to me was, you know, a lot of people, the SEC is the big deal. When I grew up, the PAC was the big deal. All the pros, you know, like the SEC has 50 pros every year in the draft. Well, that was the PAC back in the day. And to have, no longer have the PAC 10, PAC 12, whatever it was, conference is just unbelievable to me. That was such a, uh, I mean, that was, that was the West Coast, mm -hmm. right? And now they no longer have it. Uh, I, I, it's a complete shame to me. And then to have Stanford and Cal in the ACC, yeah, I mean, oh, it's no. crazy. It's all about the, it's all about the dollar, man. It really is, as you know. And, he, and they're not even getting a lot of it. But they had to kind of find a way to be a part of whatever this you want to call those four conferences. And it might not change. It might change very quickly. It, it realignment has been nuts. College football is just is sports. College sports is nuts right now. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a crapshoot. So yeah, we'll see what happens with that in the future. But it's it's weird to see Cal and Stan and SMU in the ACC. It's just a weird world we're living in. It's yeah. crazy. How many former players contact you? Okay, this is really funny. I, I'm not. A, I don't have social media. Right. I don't do any of it. So my son, and he has the same name I have. They all remember Philip, and so Philip. They all talk to Phil. All my <laughs> former players talk to Phil, and so I, and and now I'm talking to more of them because I'm retired. But uh, it's amazing. Phil says, "Dad, you cannot believe how many guys I'm talking to," and uh, which is cool for him too. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate yep. you. Enjoy retirement. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, and we've enjoyed all the great stories. So glad you were able to come in studio with us, and we will. In fact, try to do this again. Phil Snow uh, with us on 365 Sports.